Please take your Bible and turn. Let's turn to the book of Exodus chapter 24. I brought several, several lesson messages from Psalm 37, verse 4, about the desires of your heart. And um, God will give you the desires of your heart, and we spoke about that. And we then wound up speaking about uh, the Word of God, that if you desire God's Word, then the Lord will give you that desire and help you to understand the Word and so forth. Uh, in the New Testament... The Lord gives us a verse that uh, Jesus says, uh, If ye love me, what's he say? Keep my, Keep my commandments. So there's an indication uh, if we love God or not, if we love God in obedience or keeping his commandments. And when he mentions the keeping of his commandments in that portion of scripture, it's not just speaking about the Ten Commandments, though that is included, but uh, one of the words for the Word of God is commandments, it's law, those types of things. So, in other words, you could say, if you love me, keep my word, and uh, if you love me, do what God tells you to do, those types of things. And so, this evening, I want to preach another message, teach, preach another message on the Word of God. And so this will not be a specific account, per se, from the Word of God, but it will be about the Word of God. In Exodus chapter 24, I, I want to look at this verse with this statement prefacing it before we read it. Saved people are to be obedient to the Word of God. Now, wouldn't we all agree to that? Saved people are to be obedient to the Word of God. And that, that would be a premise throughout the Word of God, that saved people, God's people, Christian people, are to be obedient to the Word of God. Exodus chapter 24, look at verse 7. Exodus 24, 7. The Bible says, And he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people. And they said, All that the Lord hath said will we do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Word of God that we have read and what we will read tonight. I ask, sweet Holy Spirit of God, you take what we read and make it applicable in our lives and touch our hearts regarding the Word of God and obedience thereof to you and the Word of God. I ask that if there happens to be one that's lost here or in children's church, that you'd speak to their heart about getting saved and for every saved person that you would bless them and encourage them through the preaching of the Word of God. And wherever that the Word of God goes forth, that someone would get saved, most of all, Christ would be high and lifted up. We ask it in Jesus' name and for His sake. Amen. This portion of Scripture is referred to also in Hebrews 9.19. And I'll show that to you in Hebrews 9.19 where uh, the overall summary of Hebrews is that Christ is better. Christ is better than the, the law. In Hebrews 9.19, the Bible says, well, let's look at verse 18 for context. Whereupon neither the First Testament was dedicated without blood. He's saying the First Testament, the Old Testament, it was dedicated with blood. We just read that. That's what he was talking about. The covenant, the, the Old Testament, it was dedicated to the, uh, the people with blood. Moses read it, they heard it, and said, All that the Bible says there will do. And so there was an entrance into that covenant with blood. 
For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. He's talking about the people joining into the covenant of the word of God. And there was the blood sprinkled to say, You've entered into that covenant. And then uh, have you noticed in Hebrews chapter 10, this is also referring back to that portion of Scripture in Exodus. In Hebrews chapter uh, 10, you notice this in verse 29. The Bible says, Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the spirit of grace. The basic thought there is that a child of God upon entering into the covenant of salvation by grace through faith knows to do right, knows to obey the word of God and that when they do not and they sin willingly and willfully against the Lord, it is trotting underfoot the Son of God and what He did on the cross and counting the blood of His covenant as unholy, but that it is holy. It is doing despite unto God and to the uh, word of His grace and so forth. With the verse in Exodus 24 and these follow-up verses in the New Testament, you understand it's speaking about that same event. It's talking about the dedication of the Word of God and the people saying, we'll do it. That uh, saved people are to be obedient to the Word of God. And um, sometimes it takes some of us longer than others to come to the point of realizing that God is right and that we need to obey His Word. And uh, there would be Bible accounts of people like that as well, like Jonah. And I, I could put my testimony there. Maybe you could. Maybe some it takes a little longer. And uh, that when, when God says it, that settles it. And we are to take it as the Word of God, act upon the Word of God, and obey the Word of God. I want you to notice this in the book of Luke and in chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. In Luke and chapter 8... Beginning in verse 18, the Lord Jesus tells this group of people, Luke 8, 18, Take heed, therefore, how you hear. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given. And whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken even that which he seemeth to have. The reference there is speaking about the Word of God. The underlying thought is that if you desire the Word of God and you will listen and take heed, hear the Word of God, that God will give you more. You would combine that thought with those that have light can have more light. And those that disregard the Word of God, then that truth is not given to them. So if you want more understanding, depth, breadth, blessing from the Word of God, then God will certainly do that for you. You take heed uh, to the Word of God. Now, verse 19, the Bible says, Then came to him, Jesus, his mother and his brethren... This would be his mother and his uh, brothers, sisters, brothers that were born of his mother and could not come at him for the press. And it was told him by certain which said, 
Thy mother and thy brethren stand without desiring to see thee. Physical. And he answered and said unto them, My mother and my brethren are these which hear the word of God and do it. Spiritual. As we've often said, and you obviously know, the Lord Jesus always makes more of the spiritual, though he takes care of the physical. God takes care of your physical things. But he makes more of the spiritual things. The reverse of what we tend to do. But Jesus makes the application and emphasis on the word of God. And uh, he says that he takes ownership, he takes family with those that hear the word of God and do it. It's not a discard of his mother. He took care of his mother. It's not a discard of his brothers. The emphasis is on the word of God. And so he is making that very clear to us where the emphasis needs to be. The emphasis has to be first on the word of God. And then you'll notice this again in Luke 11. In Luke 11. In Luke 11 and verse 27. The Bible says, And it came to pass, as he spake these things, a certain woman of the company lifted up her voice and said unto him, Jesus, Blessed is the womb that bare thee, and the paps which thou hast sucked. Physical. Blessed is the mother that bore you, and that's true. Blessed is the mom that bears a child. Verse 28, But he said, Jesus said, Yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. The emphasis goes from physical blessings to spiritual blessings, and that the Lord says, They are blessed, you are blessed, we are blessed, who have a desire for the word of God, that hear the word of God, and are obedient to the Word of God. And I realize that you have that truth throughout the Word of God. I want you to notice this. I said that um, saved people are to be obedient to the Word of God. Notice this in Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2. In Isaiah chapter 2, and other of the prophets, this is what we would call one of the major prophets, and there are four major and twelve minor. And in the prophets, they speak about an event that is taking place that typically brings on some type of judgment for disobedience. And then they look far into the future, into the kingdom of God or the millennial reign of a time of blessing. And they, they don't see the church age that you and I live in. But likewise, here in Isaiah and in chapter 2, the Bible says, The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the last days. When he says in the last days, right there, he is speaking about a future event that has not happened yet. And we call it the millennial reign. It's the thousand year reign of Christ. And it is literal on this earth, with Jerusalem being the capital. Now watch this. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house, speaking about greatness of God's house, shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. Now, they would say that there is going to be a topographical change 
topography when the Lord comes back and touches. But I, I'm not after that. I'm after a simple thought right here based on us saying that saved people are to be obedient to the Word of God, and this is speaking about in the millennial reign. Verse 3, And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and He will teach us of His ways, and we will walk in His paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. That's going to be taken place in the millennial. That people in the millennial, and there's going to be a millennial temple, that people are going to be going to Jerusalem, and it is for the intent to worship God and to hear the word of God. That's what's going to be going on as we are serving the Lord. And as have been said, and you understand as a Bible student, that you and I will already have our glorified body. The Lord Jesus Christ will be uh, physically there on His throne. And the, the Jewish uh, people, saved Jews, will be uh, in their country and have their lands. But at the same time, there's going to be unsaved people. And that, that's hard for you and I to imagine, but the Bible is full of the truth of that, that there will be unsaved people during that time. And uh, th those people that come through will be saved, but there will be some natural people who are saved that birth people who need to be saved. You say, how do you know that? Well, that's for the, why the devil is uh, cast into the pit for that thousand years. And then you read what happens after that thousand years when the devil is loosed. And what he does. And so the point being here is that in the millennial reign, that nations will come up to Jerusalem and it is the intent to worship God at the temple or house of God and to learn of the word of God. Now, won't that be some learning during the millennial reign with Christ sitting there? The almost exact verbiage is expressed in Micah 4, if you notice this for a moment. Minor prophet, Micah. Jonah, Micah, Nahum. In Micah chapter 4. In Micah chapter 4, the Bible says, but in the last days. Those days haven't happened yet. That's speaking about the millennial reign. We are living in last days, but this is in the millennial reign. It shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and the people shall flow unto it. And many nations shall come and say, Come, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob, and He will teach us of His ways. We will walk in His paths. For the law shall go forth of Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem." It's almost exact verbiage of what's going to, to take place. During that time frame, if you would take your Bible and go to uh, Zechariah, almost to the end of the Old Testament, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, Zechariah chapter 14. In Zechariah and in chapter 14... This is speaking about millennial reign or eschatology. The Bible says that those nations who do not come up to worship uh, would have no rain. And some people would say, well, then this means hypothetical. But notice in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 16, the Bible says, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. What is that? That's memorial. This is in the millennial reign. Uh, they're not doing that now. This is in the future. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not that have no rain, there shall be a plague wherewith the Lord shall smite the heathen that come not up to keep the feast of the tabernacles. And so this is in millennial rain time, and, and those that would not come, 
uh, would not have rain or they would be judged that don't come up to worship the Lord and to hear the Word of God. That's the importance of the Word of God. What is it? There are going to be people who are not saved during the millennial reign. If they would see the sacrifices at that time, they, they would understand the awfulness of sin. And the Lord Jesus Christ will be there and, and put down uh, all... He will judge. I understand that. But I'm, I'm saying saved people are to be obedient to the Word of God. Lost people are disobedient to the Word of God. Notice 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter, James and Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2. In 1 Peter, in chapter 2, verse 7, the Bible says, Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious, talking about Jesus. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. To you who are saved, Christ is precious. But unto the disobedient, uh, he's a stone of stumbling, verse 8, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at what? The word. This is the importance of the word. Being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. The lost are disobedient unto the word of God. I'll show you another one, Ephesians chapter 2. Galatians, Ephesians. Chapter 2. In verse 1 is speaking about the act of obedience. And verse 2 is speaking about the time of disobedience. Ephesians 2, 1, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. And you means you if you're saved. If you have been born again, have been made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. This is when you were dead spiritually, though alive physically. All people who are born are dead spiritually. However, if they die before the age of accountability, they go to heaven. It's at the age of accountability that they have to make a choice for Christ. And then in verse 2, the Bible says, "...wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world." according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. This is the spirit of the world, the spirit of Antichrist, anti-God, anti-Bible, anti-Word, that works in the children of disobedience. The lost are disobedient to the Word of God. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. In, in chapter 5, the Bible says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Speaking about saved people. This is that uh, we are to obey the word of God and to follow God as dear children. He's our Heavenly Father, and we are the children. And if God says, go, we're to go. If God says, come, we're to come. And if you have uh, reared children or been around children, you understand that sometimes as a parent, you finally just want to say, well, get in the car, and you'll know where we're going when we get there. And you may have never done that. You may have explained every little jot and tittle to the child. But, uh, you know, why are we going? Where are we going? Are we there yet? When are we going to stop? When are we going to eat? When are we going? And you just say, you just sit back and I've got this. And sometimes, and it's not that God doesn't want us to dialogue and pray and, and ask Him and, and have dialogue, but sometimes the Lord Jesus just has to 
allow us to know that we are to follow God as dear children. And uh, as much as he wants us to know and to understand, it's in the Word of God. If you want to know what's going to take place, the best place is to be in the Word of God. You'll know what's going to take place. If you want some of your fears calmed down from all of the anxiety that is developed on the TV and media and the things of, that are so out of order... Spend more time in the Word of God. And it's nothing wrong with staying up on uh, current events and those things. But if you stay in front of the TV, you're going to be in bad shape and depressed if you spend more time there than the Word of God. And he says, follow God as dear children. Walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. That embraces every child of God. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, uh, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks." For this ye you know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Now watch verse 6 is where we were going. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. The world and those that are lost are going to suffer the consequences of the wrath of God. You say, when? Whenever the, the fullness of the times come. When God says the long suffering is over. When God says for His children as the church to come out and to come up. And then the very wrath of God is going to be poured out upon the earth in the tribulation. And so that's the children of disobedience. Uh, notice one more. Colossians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 6. The Bible uh, gives a bad grocery list of things in verse 5 that you and I are to not engage in. In fact, it says to mortify or put to death uh, in our members and the physical things of, of the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Verse 6, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. The lost are disobedient to the Word of God. And every child of God ought to desire the Word of God, to be obedient to the Word of God, and where the Lord Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments, meaning that we would be involved in the Word of God. The Bible says in Psalm 119, verse 89, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. The word of God is settled in heaven. God's plan will not change. God's purpose is not changed. And uh, the word of God ought to be the priority of every child of God, that you and I would be involved in it. The word of God cannot change because the source of the word of God cannot change. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, the Bible says, I am the Lord, I change not. The Word of God does not change. It is settled forever. God never changes. He does not need to change. And so we don't change the Word of God. We involve ourselves in the Word of God. The Word of God cannot die. They've tried to do away with the Word of God. They've tried to gather the Word of God in times past and to burn the Word of God and to do away with the Word of God but it multiplies. The Word of God cannot die because the source of the Word of God will never die. The Bible says in Psalm 90 and verse 2, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. 
The word of God abides forever, just as God abides forever. The word of God is not corrupt, though men try to corrupt it and men try to change it. The word of God is not corrupt because the source that it comes from is God and He is pure. Psalm 12, 6, the Bible speaks of the word of God as being pure. In Psalm and in chapter 12, you both have the purification of the word of God and the preservation of the word of God in two verses. The Bible says in Psalm 12, 6, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. That's the purification of the word of God. That is the preservation of the word of God. And it speaks of the God of the word. In Isaiah in chapter 6, if you would notice this for just a moment. In Isaiah and in chapter 6, we talked about uh, in your prayer life, sometimes when things are dark and very difficult, prayer life increases and we should be involved in prayer on an everyday basis, all the time speaking to the Lord. And sometimes in very difficult times in your life, then the Lord is magnified and shows up more uh, stronger in your life. And he does that today through the word of God. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. So this is a difficult time in the political and in the nation of Israel. But the prophet Isaiah saw the Lord in those difficult times. And you and I need to do that as well. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. With twain he covered his feet. And with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And it certainly will be. The word of God cannot be corrupt because of the source. And God is holy as the word of God is holy. The Word of God is magnified because God, the Word, is magnified. Psalm 138, verse 2, if you notice this for just a moment, and I'm almost done. In Psalm chapter 138, and in verse 1, the Bible says, I will praise thee with my whole heart. Before the gods will I sing praise unto thee or before others, in the presence of others. Psalm 138, verse 2. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. That is the importance of the word of God. Oh, how I love Jesus. And if we sing, oh, how I love Jesus then we love His Word. There is no separation from God and His Word. 1 John 5, 7. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And you have the written Word, which is spoken and speaks of the living Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The child of God ought to have an extreme reverence, and heart's desire for the Word of God. And if every one of us would involve ourselves more in the Word of God, then other things would be lessened, Christ would be high and lifted up and magnified, and uh, things would, would pick up in our spiritual life. And in these days, and in these last days, and in these difficult days, you and I need to embrace and cherish the Word of God and to be involved in the Word of God. I encourage you that if you're not currently reading some Bible on an everyday basis, everyday basis, that you would be involved uh, at least a chapter and that you would make it your priority within your time schedule and ask God to help you in a couple of ways. Uh, Lord, 
I want to be involved in reading your Bible more. And God, uh, I pray that you will allow for my schedule that I can read the Word of God more. And I pray that you will open up my understanding to where I can understand what I read more. But through it all, that you would give me the heart's desire to be in the Word of God and to be a student of the Word of God. And when you lift up the Word of God, you are lifting up the name of Jesus. People in the millennial reign will be going up to hear the Word of God. And you and I can do that now, should do that now, to be involving ourselves in the Word of God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Word of God. And dear Lord, the importance, of course, that you place on it. And we would never exhaust the learning, the teaching of the Word of God and how it birthed us into the family of God and then supplies our needs. And we pray, dear God, that you would help our hearts to have a stronger desire for the Word of God, to help us, dear Lord, to show it by being in the Word of God and that you would open up our understanding to the Word of God. Help us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.